An investigation was carried on to the effect of temperature the activity of an enzyme when it is immobilized when it is non-immobilized. The product of the enzyme catalyzed reaction causes a decrease in pH. So product, whatever the product causes a decrease in pH. So 100 products were formed here and the pH from 7 came down to say 5 pH. And then we have what is happening is now we have 200 products. So that is causing the pH to go down to maybe uh, 4. And then we have, uh, if we have say 300, two or 250 products, so that's gone down to uh, 4.5. Uh, no, sorry, 3.5. And then as it has gone down to 300 products, then it's gone down to 3. So the question was that you always put some figures here on the y-axis, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, or you can put 9, 8, 7 or whatever. Now it says the products cause a decrease in pH. Then it says which would give the highest yield of product at the same time. At this time, you've got to understand this was time here. Say it was 10 minutes or 5 minutes. At this time, which is the maximum number of products? That is the last line, which is non immobilized 37 degrees Celsius. So the answer was 3. So more the product, more the drop in pH. So which one was causing the greatest drop in pH? That means more of the product was being formed. Question 16, an indicator mixed with agar forms a pink color. The pink colored agar becomes colorless when put in an acid. Blocks of pink colored agar are cut to different sizes and put in acid. All other variables are kept constant. Which block becomes colorless most quickly? You have to realize is that it has to reach the center of the cube or the block. So this A was the smallest, so it only had to diffuse in 1.5 millimeter. The others are all bigger than this. So A would become colorless more quickly as compared to the others. So you had to just check which one was the smallest. And therefore, the acid only has to diffuse 1.5 millimeter in order to enter the whole block. Question 18. How many copies of each different DNA molecule are found in a cell at the start of each of these stages of the mitotic cycle? So how many copies of each different DNA molecule? So you have G2 of interphase. G2 means S, uh, S phase of interphase has passed, so now the DNA has replicated. So there will be two molecules. So they have one chromosome is one molecule and another chromosome is another molecule. So two molecules will be present. And then prophase, there will still be two. Cytokinesis, yes, each cell will then have Two. So cytokinesis will have taken place. So it says how many copies of each different DNA molecule are found in a cell at the start of each stage of the mitotic cycle. So cytokinesis, two cells will be formed. G2 of interphase, 
and of course the catch was start of each of these stages of the mitosis so cytokinesis is not occurred it is the start of cytokinesis so it means it is the end of telophase end of telophase that is why the answer is d because as yet cytokinesis has not taken place so it is the start is the g2 start of g2 of interphase start of prophase and start of cytokinesis so that means it still has not taken place at the start of each of these stages of the mitotic cycle how another question which is challenging some of the events that occur during transcription are listed so these events do occur during transcription bonds break between complementary bases bonds form between complementary bases sugar phosphate bond forms and free nucleides pair with complementary nucleotides okay let's look at the process of transcription now dna unzips a portion of dna unzips and we have some dna story here a a t t t or c c c or anything now what is going to happen new nucleotides are going to pair up here so u u u a a a now these are all pairing up so what is the free nucleotides pair with complementary so this is this part right g g g now sugar phosphate backbone forms and then this mrna will leave the nucleus so first the bonds were broken between the dna this a must be having a t here so this dna has unzipped this is the dna and this is the dna so bonds break between complementary bases then bonds form between complementary complementary bases this is between this and this sugar phosphate bonds form yes that would be this free nucleotides pair with complementary nucleotide now it says before the mrna molecule leaves the nucleus which events occur twice during transcription so bonds break between complementary bases once when the mrna leaves it again this bond breaks then bond forms between complementary bases yes now it forms between these bases then it will form between the uh, between the dna and the dna because the dna is unzipped and then the dna has to zip back again the word is used unzip we don't say unfold or uncoil so first the bonds were formed between the uh, when it unzipped then the bonds were broken and then it forms these bonds and then the mrna is going to leave the nucleus and then again the bond is going to form between the dna nucleotides so that is why the answer was d one and two only this will happen leaves the nucleus so before leave which events occur twice the gene codes for the sequence of amino acids in a single polypeptide hemoglobin consists of two alpha and two beta how many genes are needed to code for a single hemoglobin molecule you see now a gene for insulin whether it has to be made 10 times or 100 times the gene for insulin will work so alpha globin and beta globin would have two different genes because alpha globin the primary uh, primary structure would be different the sequence of amino acid would be different that is why it's been named alpha and beta because they have different primary structures so the amino acid sequence in alpha globin will be different than the beta globin but the two alpha globins will have the same primary structure so that is why the answer to 23 would be b because there will be only two genes but the genes would make two alpha and would make like for instance you have a brownies recipe where you can make 10 brownies with it or you can make 20 brownies with it now another question which was a little tough which diagram correctly shows the direction of the flow of blood through the heart so now the ones which are of course correct is fine but the one which is wrong you have to pick up the ones which are wrong and those are the ones which are the challenging one which you've got to understand now as we all know that uh, b was correct but why was b correct because you see the vena cava is bringing drug into the right atrium then from the right atrium it goes to the right ventricle then it goes into the pulmonary artery then of course the oxygenated blood flows in into the left atrium and then from the left atrium it goes into the aorta now this was the one which was correct but then why are these wrong here what was wrong this was correct this side was correct but then this was wrong aorta the blood is entering the aorta this was wrong here here the vena cava should have been entering it this was wrong here here again the vena cavas were entering and here they are showing the arrow out so this was wrong here 
So unless you know it, that you know, then you can look very carefully and say, okay, well, this is wrong, this is wrong, and this is correct. So another question, which is uh, quite challenging, which row correctly identifies the pulmonary artery? Now, you know, the pulmonary artery arises from the right ventricle, which is carrying deoxygenated blood. So the only two possible answers were A or D. Now, blood pressure in millimeters of mercury is, of course, the right ventricle will have more pressure, which will be uh, right ventricle when it pumps the blood into pulmonary artery will be a slightly more pressure, of course, less than the left ventricle. But of course, it will be. So the answer is A. But I want you to understand is that, you know, why, how would you go about this question? I'm going to show you some diagrams on this just to revise it in case this comes uh, in the exam. Now, just a diagram to make you show that there's an inner layer, the endothelium, there's a middle layer, which is a smooth muscle, and there's an outer layer, which is the collagen fibers. And when we're talking of the thickness of it, we're talking of this thickness of it. And this thickness is, of course, where a muscular artery is more muscle, so you have to understand where we are going to be asking you these questions from. Now, here's a rough estimate, and this is what we need to really learn. These elastic arteries, this thickness is one millimeter, then one millimeter, then six micrometer, then 0.5 micrometer, and then 1.0 micrometer, and then 0.5 micrometer. So how has this changed? Then, of course, I want you to see this pressure graph, which is another very interesting graph, which you keep on there. I'll keep you on asking you questions on that. And then I want you to see this, and this is the last diagram, which I want you to see, is the aorta diameter average wall thickness. Please, everybody needs to go through this, and please pause the video here and have a look at it and memorize these uh, different uh, thicknesses of the walls of the blood vessels. Now, question number 38, what do the pathogens of HIV, AIDS, malaria, and TB have in common? Now, HIV, you know, is caused by a virus. Malaria, you know, is caused by plasmodium, not by Anopheles mosquito. Please understand that plasmodium, which is a protozoa, so it's a eukaryote. It's a eukaryote. And then TB is caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis, so it's a bacteria. It's a prokaryote. Now, if you look at these, prokaryote, eukaryote, and uh, protozoa is a eukaryote. So the difference is between prokaryote, eukaryote, and a virus. This is chapter one. So the main thing is you've got to understand why is it D? Why is the answer D? Because there is no cell surface membrane in the virus. There is no cell surface membrane in the virus. The only thing which is common is genetic material because virus has a protein coat and has a DNA or an RNA strand. Plasmodium, of course, would have a normal eukaryotic cell, would have the nucleus and a cell membrane and everything. While bacteria would have a cell wall, cell membrane, and then outer cell wall, and then a cell membrane inside and a circular DNA. So the only thing which is common is the genetic information, which is the DNA or the RNA, which will be present in a virus. And that is why they've asked you this question. They're questioning whether you know virus, malaria, and TB. TB is caused by bacteria prokaryote. Malaria by plasmodium eukaryote and AIDS by virus and virus and this have only one thing common is genetic genes or the nucleic acid. Now another difficult question, the diagram shows the immune response followed following infection by virus. So we have activated cells, then we have activated cells, then we have chemical stimulation and then we have which row identifies the cells labeled E, F, G, and H? So let's look at E, F, G, and H. First, let's circle them and then figure them out what are they. Now, I would have started off from H because I can see that they're making antibodies. So if they are making antibodies, they would be plasma B cells. So I narrow down to this because the other two are possible answers are not really correct. So I've narrowed it down to A and B. Now I look at other ones and I look at uh, F. F is making chemical stimulation. So F has to be the T helper cell. So this is why it will be the T helper cell. Then we've got E. E must be the B memory cell because this is part of the B cell response. You can see this whole thing is the B cell response. Activation, then uh, differentiation. First, of course, selection, then cloning, then differentiation into memory B cells and plasma B cells and plasma B cells uh, make antibodies. And this, of course, the host infected with the virus, so G would be the T killer cells. So this is why how I would have sort of, you know, sorted this out. So 39 question answer would be A. And that is how I would have figured this out. Uh, if you don't remember it, please just revise it or go through the videos which I've done on this.
Then coming to the last difficult question, monoclonal antibodies are used to test for the presence of the hormone HCG in the urine of a human female during early pregnancy. Which statement describes how the monoclonal antibodies used in this test are produced? Number one, HCG is injected into a mouse and plasma cells in the mouse produce antibodies specific to HCG. Fine. Antibodies are extracted from the mouse. Here there is some sort of a mistake. Antibodies are extracted from the mouse and then fused with cancer cells. So please remember antibodies are not cells. Antibodies are proteins. Heavy chain, light chain, that story you have got to remember. And then number three, single hybridoma cells are cultured and they divide by mitosis to produce a clone of hybridoma cells, which are of course going to produce that specific antibody. So two was incorrect. So that is why the answer is C. One and three only. I'm going to revise this with you all in a minute and then you can see where this was wrong. The antibodies are extracted for the mouse and then fused with cancer cells. No, 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 no. Plasma B cells are extracted and then they are fused with the myeloma cells and that results in a hybridoma and then the hybridoma cells are cultured and they produce the antibodies which we require. Now this is just a quick recap of uh, the monoclonal antibody. You inject the mouse with antigen, you extract, the, you actually kill the mouse, extract the spleen cells and then you take the cell culture of myeloma cells and then you fuse them and you select a group of hydro hybrid cells and then you separate the hybrid cells, allow them to proliferate into clones or hybridoma. Then you screen for the desired antibody. Well, these probably are wrong. These are wrong. These are the ones we want. And chosen hybridoma is then grown to produce large batches of desired MAB. MAB is monoclonal antibodies, MABs. Uh, that finishes this uh, uh, fourth video on difficult MCQs. And I hope this is going to help you in the exam. And best of luck. And thank you very much for subscribing and watching. Thank you.